Welcome to St Albans, one of Britain's most historic cities of all. Named for the nation's very first saint, St Albans, though by no means a huge city, is home to a staggering wealth of history. And on this walk around St Albans, we'll see everything from England's last remaining medieval bell tower to the country's oldest pub. We'll also take a look inside the spectacular St Albans Cathedral, the site of the longest continuous Christian worship in England, and even get a peek at the ruins of the nearly 2,000 year old settlement of Verulamium, once upon a time the third largest town in Roman Britain. There's so, so much to see in St Albans, but we begin our walk in the heart of the modern city centre, looking towards the old town hall from the historic marketplace. Despite being known as the Old Town Hall, this building, also referred to as the Courthouse, is actually relatively new, considering the scope of St Albans' lengthy history. Built in 1826, this grand civic building was designed as a modern and rather extravagant replacement for a much older Moot Hall of the 16th century, a building which served much the same purpose and stood just a few feet away on the marketplace. The local council, however, moved out of this white 19th century town hall long ago in 1929, and so nowadays this building plays host to the St Albans Museum and Gallery, which moved in in 2018, and which serves as one of a number of places to visit to discover the story of this fascinating city. From the Romans to the Normans and many more, St Albans has been the site of notable human activity for the majority of recorded English history. Now this part of the city, along the busy St Peter's Street, is evidently much more modern, with a wealth of office buildings, high street shops and more that were built in the 20th century. But interestingly, it was on this site that an important historical event took place all the way back in 1381. Roughly where the old town hall stands, it was in that year that a then 14-year-old King Richard II sentenced a man named John Ball to death. Hung, drawn and quartered right here in St Albans, John Ball found himself catching the ire of the king as he was one of the leaders of the famed Peasants' Revolt, one of the first major rebellions against the monarchy in medieval England. A widespread uprising that lasted for around five months and even saw a peasant-led siege of the Tower of London, it was ordinary members of the public like John Ball, who was a simple priest in East Anglia, that came to lead the rebellion, although ultimately he and other rebel leaders were executed as the monarchy suppressed the uprising, and Richard II remained in power for another 18 years. But there's more to St Albans' association with the revolt than John Ball's execution here on the marketplace, and we'll talk more about that when we reach one of the rebels' most important meeting points later on in our walk. When it wasn't being used for executions, however, St Albans' marketplace here was of course a place of trade and still is to this day, markets having been held in this city since at least the year 860 AD, although that history can be stretched back even further to the 1st century AD, when trading took place on the forum of the Roman town of Verulamium. Verulamium, however, was situated in an area a short distance away from the modern city centre of St Albans, and while we'll venture towards the former Roman settlement later, this part of St Albans offers a nice blend of the city's modern and medieval characteristics. Passing by the entrance of the Christopher Place shopping centre, we find ourselves on a narrow street known as French Row, which was laid out around the mid 14th century, and which was historically known by a different name, Cobbler's Row, as this was where you would have found the workshops of local shoemakers. 700 years later, those old cobblers are long gone, but French Row retains a charmingly medieval appearance, in no small part owing to the presence of the historic medieval bell tower at the foot of the street, and a collection of historic pubs to our right here. With its upper floor hanging over the street, the white building immediately on our right is actually one of the oldest in all of St Albans, dating from the early 15th century, when it was built as the Christopher Inn. Nowadays an Italian restaurant, the Christopher Inn has had a number of different uses over the centuries. In fact, in the early Victorian era, it became a crowded slum residence, home to as many as 10 families, 
but for most of its life, this was a popular town pub, visited not just by locals, but people who came passing through St Albans too, as evidenced by this large passageway just down beside the pub's facade. This opening, still made up of old wooden beams, was built to allow horse and carriages to pass from St Albans High Street and Marketplace into Christopher Yard, the rear of the pub, where carriages would be parked and people would congregate outside. But the Christopher Inn is by no means the only historic pub to be found in this part of town, as just next door we find the old Fleur de Lys, an inn of the early 16th century. The history of the pub's name, however, can actually be traced back to 1356, when according to legend, King John II of France stayed in a previous building on this site after he was captured as a prisoner of war following the Battle of Poitiers, an important English victory during the Hundred Years' War. The Fleur de Lys, a famous symbol of French royalty, therefore became the name of the pub, though the legend is more than likely a falsehood. But what's not in doubt is the significance of the building that's towering over us just here, St Albans historic clock tower. Built at some point between 1403 and 1412, this more than 600 year old structure is now claimed to be the last remaining medieval bell tower in all of England. A symbol of the city, the clock tower is a popular attraction for visitors to St Albans in the modern day and on spring and summer weekends you can even go up to the top for a view across the city. But why was it built in the first place? Well when it was built, public clocks were actually a rarity in England, and it's likely that the tower initially featured no clock but simply bells, used to signal the hour of night curfew to the townspeople. Over time though, with its added clock face, the tower became a convenient timepiece. But by virtue of being built with local funds, it also served as an important show of independence by the people of St Albans in the face of the rule of the Abbot of St Albans, who ran the nearby abbey, and with it much of the economy of the medieval town. We'll talk more about that a little later on when we visit the old abbey turned cathedral. But here at the foot of the clock tower, we're looking at a fetching spiral bench that stands on the site of a pair of important historic structures. In 1294, St Albans was one of 12 places in England where a so-called Eleanor Cross was built on the orders of King Edward I, denoting the 12 places where the coffin of his late wife, Eleanor of Castile, rested nightly on its way from where she died near Lincoln to London. St Albans Eleanor Cross, which stood just in front of us, was a famous local monument for centuries, but it was partially destroyed during the English Civil War of the 17th century and was fully demolished in 1701, replaced by another, long since gone landmark, the old Market Cross, which was a covered, gazebo-like structure which market traders used to sell their goods, though this too was eventually demolished in 1810. The Market Cross was originally built, however, to stand just beside this busy road, the High Street, which before the development of St Peter's Street, where we started our walk, was the major thoroughfare through St Albans. Nowadays it's still an active place and home to plenty more shops, including a particularly charming shopping arcade that links the busy high street with the much calmer area surrounding St Albans Cathedral. Though not necessarily the most direct route between the city centre and cathedral, if you are in town, do take a stroll through this, known as the Village Arcade which is delightful not just for its beautiful decorations, but also for its wealth of independent, locally run shops and businesses, including beauty salons, craft shops and a lovely tea room that you'll find at the end of this covered street. Now St Albans, a city of some 80,000 people in the modern day, has plenty of shopping facilities alongside its wealth of history. Quirky and quaint offbeat locations like the Village Arcade here are always a joy to visit, while St Peter's Street and the Malting Shopping Centre are your go-to places if you're looking for familiar chains. And a spot of shopping can provide a nice break from all of the historic buildings and landmarks that you'll find in the city, particularly in the area we're just about to walk into. Venturing out of the village arcade and back into the sunlight, we now find ourselves in a small landscaped garden that separates the shops of the High Street with the immense St Albans Cathedral.
St Albans Cathedral absolutely dominates the southern edge of the heart of the modern city, and we'll be taking an in-depth look at the building from both outside and in in just a few minutes. But here, we're passing by what looks at first glance like a simple horse chestnut tree. Interestingly, however, this tree is known as the Verdun tree, as it was grown from a conker that was taken from the last surviving tree on the otherwise hellish battlefield at Verdun in the First World War. Planted in 1976, 60 years after the battle, the tree now doubles as a memorial to Verdun, one of the deadliest in World War I, while also introducing us to an area of St Albans that's full of beautiful nature. From here, we'll be making our way out of the city centre, past the cathedral, and towards the enormous Verulamium Park, on the site of the Roman settlement of Verulamium. But before we get there, there's plenty more to see in this part of the city, which was historically known by the name Vintry. A small area between Waxhouse Gate, the street just beside us, and Holywell Hill, a short distance to the southeast, Vintry takes its name from the historic presence of vineyards that may have existed in this part of St Albans Abbey precinct. And here, the grand brick walls of the Vintry Garden still bear vines, much like the past. Now these vineyards were by no means sprawling plantations, likely only taking up the area where the Verdun tree now stands, but they were an important source for the growing of grapes used to make wine, which was used widely by the monks who resided at the prestigious St Albans Abbey, a grand monastery that existed where the cathedral does today. The immense building we see towering above us here was originally built as the church of the abbey dedicated to St Alban a monastery that can trace its origins back to the late 8th century, over 1200 years ago. And for just under 800 years, this part of town was the exclusive domain of the abbey, with the Vintry Garden that we're walking through now used as a graveyard for the monks who resided there. It was only around the 19th century that this area became a landscaped garden, which is still popularly used by locals as a nice retreat from the busy roads of the city centre, but it serves as an important introduction for what has, for much of St Albans history, been the most important area of town. Making our way out of the Vintry Garden now, we're going to take a walk around the outside of the modern cathedral, before we take a peek inside too, because St Albans Cathedral is one of the most unusual in all of Britain. As we mentioned, the cathedral began life as an abbey church, that being the main building of worship for those who worked and resided in the monastery. Construction on the abbey church began well over 900 years ago in the year 1077, although the building that we see today features a range of different architectural styles, ranging from then all the way up to the 19th century. But one interesting feature that you might have already spotted about St Albans Cathedral is the flag that's flying proudly above its central tower, a flag that might look rather familiar. St Albans, located just 20 miles outside London, is not the kind of place you'd expect to see the Scottish saltire waving in the wind, but that's not actually what we can see up on top of the cathedral. In fact, that flag is the St Albans Cross, not blue and white like St Andrew's Cross, but rather blue and yellow. It's a symbol that you'll see all over the modern city, not just on flags, but coats of arms, logos, and all of the railings around the abbey here. And its design can likely be traced back to the Anglo-Saxon period, when the cross was used as the symbol of the Kingdom of Mercia, of which St Albans was a part. Before it symbolised Mercia, however, the cross came into use to represent St Alban, the man to whom this cathedral is still dedicated, and after whom the entire city is named. Alban lived here in the 3rd or 4th century when the Romans still controlled Britain, and when Verulamium was the main settlement here. Now interestingly, while much of the Roman town of Verulamium is now buried beneath the ground, the cathedral that we're looking at here is actually partially built of Roman bricks and stone, used as a convenient building material by the Anglo-Saxons to rebuild the abbey after it was destroyed by the Vikings. This was all done in dedication to God and St Alban, who is actually regarded as the very first British Christian martyr, 
who's believed to have been executed by the Romans here in Verulamium around 1700 years ago. We'll talk more about St Alban as we continue to explore this cathedral, but take note of this spectacular window on the building's north transept here. Known as the Rose Window, it's one of a number of eye-catching features of the cathedral that you can see from the outside, complete with a colourful collection of stained glass designs, although these are extremely recent, unveiled in 1989. Because while St Alban's Cathedral was of course originally a product of the Norman era, the building has changed quite dramatically in the last couple of centuries, a symptom of its roller coaster of a history. As we know, this was the Abbey Church from the 11th century until the 16th century, when St Alban's Abbey was dissolved in 1539 under the orders of King Henry VIII, one of thousands of monasteries around the country to fall victim to the King's sprawling campaign. As part of the dissolution, the many other buildings that made up the Abbey complex were demolished, while the church was plundered for its most valuable wares but the townspeople decided to buy it and convert it into their own parish church. As you can see, however, the church is enormous, and at the time the civilian settlement of St Albans was far from a big place, home to around 2,000 people, who struggled to cobble together the funds to keep this much larger than needed parish church in good condition. For around three centuries then, this historic abbey church fell into neglect, the roof even caving in and being left open to the elements for decades. But things finally changed for the better in the late 19th century. This, the western façade of the cathedral, features a wealth of Gothic architecture, a style that was very much in vogue in the Victorian era. And this was added to the formerly Norman church as part of a wide-ranging, albeit highly controversial, 19th century restoration after this once dilapidated church was elevated to the status of a cathedral in 1877. And a building of such high status couldn't be left in disrepair, prompting a feverish restoration inside and out that included simple changes like fixing the roof, but also stylistic transformations, which we'll talk more about in a few moments. Now inside the cathedral, however, we can take in the majesty of its incredible architecture. This part of the church is known as the nave, that being the central area where worship takes place. And notably, St Alban's nave is by far the longest of any cathedral in England, stretching for a mighty 85 metres or 279 feet. Stretching that length above us is the wooden roof of the nave, part of which was restored in the 19th century, and part of which dates back around 600 years to the 15th century. The part of the roof that fell in before the restoration, meanwhile, is located above the side aisle just to our right here, and with its repair, this historic place of worship was saved from ruin, still standing proudly for all who visit St Albans to see today. Now there's much more to St Albans Cathedral than just the nave here. You could stroll much deeper into the church and even see the medieval shrine dedicated to St Alban himself. We'll just take a brief look around the nave here before we head out, however. But even in this part of the church, there's plenty to take in, from the beautiful stained glass windows to the roof, and most impressively, a collection of remarkable wall paintings, some of which are more than 800 years old. Adorning the pillars of the left side of the nave are some of the finest medieval wall paintings still in existence around England depicting scenes from the Bible and history. Most have weathered somewhat over the past eight centuries, some having even been defaced or painted over when the abbey was dissolved by King Henry VIII. But when they were originally painted, these images were bursting with colour, and recent efforts by the cathedral have given birth to spectacular digital recreations of how the wall paintings would have looked at their very best. The medieval wall paintings aren't the only captivating images to inspect in this part of the church, though. On the inside of the nave's northern wall just to our left, you'll also find an eye-catching depiction of the history of St Alban's Cathedral in the form of a beautiful new tapestry, which details the development of the building all the way from 1066 up to the modern day. As we know, however, the history of this building goes back even further than 1066, established in the 8th century 
and being dedicated to the Roman era Saint Alban. But who exactly was he? Well, little is known for certain about Alban, but according to legend, he was a humble citizen living in the Roman town of Verulamium, during a time when Christianity was outlawed across the entire Roman Empire. Despite this, Alban is said to have been sheltering a Christian priest at his house in this town, and when the Roman authorities came searching for the priest, Alban helped him to escape unscathed. This, of course, landed him in hot water with the Roman authorities, and Alban was arrested and forced to renounce his Christian faith. But he refused, leading him to be beheaded on a hill overlooking what is now the city of St. Albans. Alban is therefore recognised as Britain's very first Christian saint, with this cathedral still standing as a monument in his honour some 1700 years later in history. But let's head out of St Albans Cathedral back into the daylight now, because surrounding this historic place of worship are a number of other fascinating landmarks that tell us a bit more about the story of this city. Looking across the green, for example, we can see the only other surviving building from the Abbey of St Albans, that being the Abbey Gateway, an imposing gateway that dates back to the 14th century, which was a time of great upheaval in England, and in St Albans in particular. You'll remember from the start of our walk that St Albans played a major role in the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, and just outside what was once the strongly guarded barrier to the Abbey, we find a small garden, known as the Romeland Garden. Despite St Albans' links with Roman history, this Romeland actually takes its name from Old English, effectively meaning Rumland, or an open space. And it was on this open space that a number of civilians gathered when they had had enough with the then all-powerful abbot. For centuries, the abbot of St Albans dominated the local economy, holding exclusive rights to the milling industry, for example. And over time, this began to enrage civilians, who felt they were being suffocated by his rule. Therefore, as the Peasants' Revolt was gaining steam in the summer of 1381, they decided to meet here, and storm the Abbey Gateway, which at the time was also being used as a prison, though, like the rest of the revolt, their siege ended in failure. Although just 20 years later, the townspeople did come together to fund the building of the Clock Tower, which as we mentioned, served as a show of their independence in the face of imposing Abbey-owned landmarks like this. But as well as serving as a simple gatehouse, the Great Gateway of St Albans Abbey has had a number of different uses over time. In the late 15th century, it became the home of the St Albans Press, just the third printing press ever established in England, while after the dissolution of the Abbey in 1539, this gatehouse was converted for use as a much larger prison, and then in the late 19th century, it became the property of the prestigious St Albans School, which occupies a large area on the edge of Romeland and the Abbey. Now St Albans School itself is another of this city's fascinating features, in fact, it's regarded as one of the oldest schools in the world, with a history dating all the way back to 948 AD, when it was established by the abbot. That makes St Albans School older than the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, Eton College, and many more prestigious educational institutions, and it's most famous as a cradle of scientific education, notably having been the school where none other than a young Professor Stephen Hawking studied in the 1950s. The gateway, though added to the school fairly late on in its already illustrious history, has become one of its many iconic symbols. But having made our way through it, we now find ourselves inside what was once the domain of St Albans Abbey. Nowadays the site of the old abbey complex is home to a mix of houses, a huge open park, the school, and of course the great buildings that we've been circling. And this brings our attention back to the cathedral. We mentioned that the cathedral's western façade here is adorned with mostly Gothic architecture, which may look rather lovely at first glance, but unfortunately is rather unfaithful to the history of this spectacular church. The 19th century restoration of St Albans Abbey, after it was designated a cathedral, was carried out quickly under the watch of the Lord Grimthorpe, a driven and wealthy individual who had a clear, albeit controversial, vision for the cathedral. Historically, this Norman church featured relatively simplistic architecture, the plain tower at the centre of the building being a great example. 
but Grimthorpe was a fan of the much admired Victorian Gothic architectural style. And so rather than simply restoring the old Norman church to its former glory, he ordered the cathedral to be redesigned with grand Gothic features, like the rose window we saw earlier, the western facade, and many more. In modern terms, this would be like replacing Big Ben's clock face with a digital watch, a complete travesty to its majesty and heritage. And Grimthorpe's restoration of St Albans Cathedral here was in fact so controversial that in the very same year it began, lovers of architectural heritage came together to form the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, founded by William Morris and Philip Webb. The Society still operates today, and although they weren't able to put a stop to Grimthorpe's so-called destruction of St Albans Cathedral, they continue to work to protect the heritage of ancient buildings all over the UK and Ireland, from cottages to castles, churches and cathedrals. Now of course, there were once many more ancient buildings in this area of St Albans, though Henry VIII can be blamed for the loss of most of the medieval abbey buildings, which stood where there now exists this sprawling park. Sloping down the hill from the cathedral though, this park links the old abbey precinct with the even bigger Verulamium Park, the site of the old Roman town that we'll now make our way towards. But in between the two, there's yet another fascinating landmark that can't be missed on a walk around St Albans, so let's jump towards that. About a two and a half minute walk down the hill from the cathedral, you'll find this, the Old Fighting Cocks which claims to be the oldest pub in all of England. To put that into context, in 2022, there were an estimated 37,000 pubs in England, and this one on the edge of St Albans claims to be the oldest of them all. But can that really be true? Well, the old fighting cock certainly has a long and complex history. According to its claim, it was opened for business 1,230 years ago in 793 AD, the same year as the Abbey was founded. The pub as we see it today is certainly old in age, dating to the 11th century in its oldest parts, although this building, known as the Old Roundhouse, was rebuilt in the late 16th century after a major flood. This octagonal part of the pub is particularly iconic, however, as for much of its reputed history, the inn was actually known as the Roundhouse, and it only became the Fighting Cox in the 19th century, possibly as it was used as a venue for the then popular sport of cockfighting. But while the pub is certainly historic, its claim of opening over 1200 years ago isn't certain. In fact, the earliest records of this inn are much more recent, first referred to in 1756, when it was named the Three Pigeons. The Guinness Book of Records actually rescinded the pub's award as the oldest in England in 2000, when it became apparent there was no evidence for its claim. But whatever the truth, the old fighting cocks is certainly worth a visit for a pint, and a window into history in this wonderful part of St Albans. Just outside the pub and its beer garden, there flows a delightful waterway with its own history. This is the River Ver and once upon a time, it was just down beside us here that one of the abbot's mills was located, a crucial part of his grip on St Albans industry in the medieval period. The river itself, however, has a history that goes back much, much further than even the abbot. It's only a short waterway, flowing for 17 miles across the south of Hertfordshire, but it's an extremely rare one too. The Ver is a chalk stream, rising from springs beneath chalk bedrock in the ground, and there are only thought to be around 210 streams like this in the entire world. Now this might just seem like an interesting quirk of geography, but chalk streams like the Ver actually have special importance, as they're generally much cleaner by nature than most rivers, therefore being able to support specific types of wildlife that can't survive in other environments. In St Albans, the river was an important arm in the city's once bountiful watercress industry, producing the plant in great quantities back in the 19th century. But most famously, the River Ver lends its name to Verulamium, the historic Roman settlement that once existed right here, where we now find the immense Verulamium Park. With the Roman town buried beneath the ground here, the 100-acre Verulamium Park is a cradle of both history and nature. Its best natural feature is of course the huge Verulamium Lake, 
that we can see stretching out in front of us here, and it's actually completely frozen over on this frigid winter's day. Whatever the weather though, the lake is a great place to stroll beside, and it's particularly loved by bird watchers, as it's home to everything from your classic swans and ducks to lesser spotted waterfowl like herons, great crested grebes, swallows and house martins. I don't know much about birds myself, but as well as the natural spectacle on display in this sprawling park, there are plenty of clues to the origins of Roman St Albans, Verulamium, as we mentioned, having once been the third largest town in Roman Britain. We've walked a short distance across the park from the lake and the river, and here we find the last remains of Verulamium's once extensive city walls. Specifically, these remains are known as St Germain's Block, and originally they formed part of the great walls that surrounded Verulamium, this point having been the eastern edge of the Roman settlement. Those walls extended for a great distance across what are now fields, parks and residential streets, although almost all of the walls are long since gone. As we mentioned earlier, centuries after the Romans abandoned Verulamium and Britain in general, Developers of the medieval town of St Albans used the stones from Roman buildings and walls to construct new buildings, most notably the abbey. But the reason that this small section of the Roman walls still remains in situ is that it was actually incorporated into the medieval chapel of St Germain, which was built here on the edge of the abbey precinct around the 11th century. As a result, this gives us a clear idea of the presence of a great Roman settlement where the park is today but St Germain's Block is far from the only Roman remains that you'll find in this part of St Albans. If you walk about five minutes further across Verulamium Park, you'll see a small white building inside which you'll find this, an almost perfectly preserved Roman mosaic and hypercaust. Excavated in the 1930s, this elaborate mosaic served as a floor decoration for a great Roman townhouse that's thought to have been built in the year 180 AD, a period when Verulamium was undergoing a much wider rebuild after it was devastated by a great fire just years earlier. Now the mosaic that we're looking at here, beautifully preserved under shelter now, is free to visit for visitors 1800 years after it was originally built but the remains of this historic townhouse are just one of likely many that lie beneath your feet as you walk through Verulamium Park. However, the Roman settlement of Verulamium extended even further than the area that the park covers today, and just a bit further to the north of the park, you'll find some of the most impressive Roman remains in all of Britain today. Take a walk through the delightful suburb of St Michael's and cross over the Hemel Hempstead Road to reach this, the excavated remains of the Roman town of Verulamium. You do have to pay to visit these remains, about £3 per person, and while here we're looking at the foundations of another 2nd century townhouse, elsewhere in this excavated area you'll see the remains of a row of Roman shops, but most impressively of all, the uncovered Roman theatre of Verulamium. Evidence of this theatre's existence was discovered in 1869 and fully unearthed in 1935, and it's an invaluable window into what life was like in Roman Verulamium just under 2,000 years ago. Now the Roman settlement in what is now St Albans began shortly after they invaded Britain in the year 43 AD, when they took over what was the native settlement of Verlamion, where the Celtic Catuvelauni tribe lived. Initially, what the Romans christened Verulamium wasn't an especially significant town, but it was situated on one of the great roads that they built across the colony of Britannia, that being Watling Street, which stretched all the way from London, or Londinium, in the direction of the prestigious Roman fort at modern-day Chester. With many people passing through Verulamium on their way along Watling Street, therefore, the town began to grow in size and stature. Now Verulamium, alongside London and Colchester, was briefly burned to the ground by Boudicca during her rebellion of 61 AD, but the Romans rebuilt the town on a grander scale, notably featuring the theatre that we can see right here. 
Now the Romans are probably better known for their amphitheatres, the remains of a number of which you can see in towns and cities all over England and Wales. But St Albans Theatre is the only one of its kind which has been fully excavated in the UK, and it's a little different from a classic gladiatorial amphitheatre. Originally built around the year 140 AD, this theatre, although occasionally hosting gladiatorial matches, was mostly used for dramatic performances, pantomimes, as well as bullfights and the odd public execution too. At full capacity, more than 7,000 people were able to crowd into the theatre of Verulamium, everybody from Roman dignitaries to ordinary civilians and even slaves, and they'd all sit on wooden benches that overlooked the stage on these curved banks that we can see beneath us. Venturing down into the theatre, however, this historic venue did change a number of times over the period of Roman occupation, and the remains as we see them today are more indicative of how this theatre would have looked around the year 300 AD. By this point, Verulamium had grown to become the third largest town in Roman Britain, and so its theatre became even more extravagant with brand new facilities for both the audience and performers, and a grand monumental arch that stood just outside the building behind the stage. One thing to note, of course, is that this was an open-air theatre, which provided a different experience from the typical kind of theatres we're used to today. Otherwise, however, this Roman theatre was moderately similar to the modern kind. And here, we're looking at what was once the stage on which actors performed and projected for hundreds of years. The column that stands in front of us was one of three that served as a backdrop to the action unfolding on stage, while the stone foundations that stand behind it belong to the changing rooms and the grand archway we mentioned just a few moments ago. This theatre, along with the many more Roman remains that we've seen, are fantastic examples of what everyday life was like for people living in Verulamium, a great town that existed just on the outskirts of what evolved into the equally great city of St Albans. From its Roman ruins to its majestic medieval landmarks, beautiful nature, ancient institutions and so much more, St Albans is a city overflowing with stories to tell and sights to see. And located just on the outskirts of London, it's a place well worth visiting if you're ever in the region. Sadly, however, as we carefully step through the remains of this nearly 1900-year-old Roman theatre, it's here that we've reached the end of our walk around St Albans. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you're looking forward to visiting St Albans for yourself sometime soon.